I would like to just say a few words to introduce Dr. Nakanjako. Dr. Nakanjako is a professor of medicine and the deputy dean of the School of Medicine at Makare University College, University College of Health Sciences, Kampala, Uganda. She has over 16 years experience in infectious diseases care, research and training at different platforms, including community trials with sample interventions such as safe water and cotrimoxazole prophylaxis to reduce morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV, hospital-based studies to evaluate the implementation of basic tools like provider-initiated HIV testing and routine TB screening to improve access to HIV diagnosis, management of HIV, TB co-infections, and timely initiation of antiretroviral therapy in a hospital setting epidemiological studies to understand immune recovery in long-term HIV treatment cohorts, laboratory-based studies to understand cellular mechanisms of suboptimal immune recovery, as well as clinical trials on innovative interventions of adjuvant therapy to maximize the benefits of ART among people living with HIV. She is currently involved in translational research in infectious and immunity at Makare University's Infectious Disease Institute to build local capacity to utilize basic science research to improve patient care. And not only was Dr. Nakanjako is an alumni of the of the program of the fellowship program but she's also now she also sits on the steering committee so thank you so much dr nakanjako for being here with us today it's a pleasure and um i will let you take over thank you for the kind introduction um as we start i would love to know who is online kindly say your name and the institution you are in and what you're doing so that we get to know each other on the call. Good morning or good evening, doctor. I'm Guillermo Salvatierra and I'm calling from Lima, Peru. I'm okay. a veterinarian and I'm working in antibiotic resistance. I'm from University Cayetano Heredia. Welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Mwesuga Emmanuel. I'm a psychiatrist in, from Uganda. I'm working on um, first episode psychosis and trying to understand the reasons why patients delay to come for care. Welcome. Hi, my name's Phil. I'm uh, with UCSF and I'm in uh, Kisumu, Kenya. I do family planning research. I'm an OBGYN. Welcome. Hi, uh, this is uh, Archana from India. So I'm basically working in adolescent mental health as part of this uh, fellowship. Hi, this is Zach from Guatemala City, and I'm currently working on Zika virus surveillance. Welcome. Hi, my Hello. name is Hello, I'm Jason Kaya from Peru. I'm working, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I'm Jason Kaya from Peru, working at Cayetano Heredia University. Um, working at the, at the same time in Quitos, in, in Peru and the Amazon. So we are working in Plasmodium vivax, looking for biomarkers in the human cells. Thank you. Welcome, Jason. Hi, my name is Becky DeBoer. I'm an oncology fellow at UCSF, and um, I'm working in Tanzania and Rwanda um, on a project looking at shared decision making in uh, non curative cancer treatment. Welcome. Thank you. And then we also have Vincent. Uh, Vincent is a fourth year medical student at UCLA who is researching. HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis prep in Lima, Peru. 
And then we have June, who is a veterinarian at UC Davis and conducting emerging infectious disease surveillance at Sequoia University of Agriculture in Tanzania. Okay, welcome all of you and thank you for coming to my talk. So I'll share briefly, I've been introduced as a professor of medicine at Macquarie University, where I'm also the deputy dean for the School of Medicine and also a scientific director for the Translational Lab at the Infectious Disease Institute, Macquarie University. So I'll briefly talk about my training, my research experience and career development in HIV care and treatment. And I raise a few challenges and my future directions. So then it will be open out for questions and answer session. So I trained as a clinician with bachelor's in medicine and surgery from Macquarie University. After which, uh, after one and a half years of practice, I went back to do internal medicine as a specialty. This is the M Med offered at Makere, and this was funded by the Fogarty Actuary Program at Case Western Reserve University. So this is funding that I applied for and got to support my master's training and research back at Makere University. After graduating from my master's, uh, I joined uh, a five-year clinical research fellowship program at the Infectious Disease Institute, and this was a Gilead funded opportunity that I also applied for and won competitively. And during the five years, I focused on HIV treatment and for infections. I, also, I looked at immune recovery, clinical data that led to the subsequent lab studies that I have done on following up HIV patients in the HIV treatment cohort at the Infectious Disease Institute. Uh, during this time, I also did my doctoral training, which was with the University of Antwerp under the supervision of Robert Kolebundas and Moses Kamia, uh, mainly in biomedical sciences. And this was, the research was also based at the Infectious Disease Institute where I, I continued, uh, where I initiated my work on HIV treatment outcomes and also had a significant part of bench work for the biomedical research experiments. So this was at a time when uh, HIV was still the leading cause of death in, in Uganda. The HIV prevalence had decreased a bit from high levels of 31% in, in the 1990s. So at the time I did my PhD, the HIV prevalence was 8% among women and 6% among men. And at the time, the knowledge of HIV status was just 66% for women and about 45% for men. And ART coverage was still as low as 39%. And at, even when we were starting at CD4 counts that were 350 and below. But today we know that HIV coverage has improved to 73%. People are receiving ART, although we still have 50,000 new infections and we want you to have 26,000 age-rated deaths in Uganda. So I'm saying this as an introduction because most of my research has been based on HIV care, which is a burden in Uganda, and at the Infectious Disease Institute, which was set up to mainly handle the HIV epidemic at Macquarie University. So uh, after my medical training, my first work was engagement in two community studies. I worked as a study coordinator with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Uganda. We had a randomized clinical trial in Eastern Uganda, testing simple clinical interventions like safe water. As you may see, this is the rural community in Eastern Uganda. 
and this is the safe water vessel that we were trying out in this community study where we randomized people to the safe water system and followed up weekly in weekly visits and then we also gave them potomoxazole prophylaxis to understand the additive effect of safe water and potomoxazole among HIV treatment outcomes. I highlight this study because it was the beginning of my involvement in HIV research and starting at a community level, I found that simple interventions like just safe water and botumoxazole at a time when ART was not yet widespread in Uganda, these simple interventions were able to improve uh, the lives of people living with HIV. So this was a home-based trial and we found that so, uh, the, just the safe water system reduced diarrhea frequency and severity among people living with HIV. And adding cotrimox has actually reduced the morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV. Right today, the safe water system and cotrimox are already available as part of the basic care package for people living with HIV. I think today they've added mosquito nets, ITNs as well for prevention of malaria. So this has translated into policy to become part of the, of the starter pack for HIV, people living with HIV. So these are some of the publications that came out of that work. The first one looking at showing the safe water system with pollination. And the second one looking at the effect of cotrimoxazole. I highlight these publications because they were my first involvement in research, as you can see, I'm author X. Um, uh, although I'm a non-significant author, I value these publications because they helped me get introduced to academic research and writing. And because I participated in the research implementation, data analysis. So I got an opportunity to go through all aspects of the rigorous clinical trial under the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I believe this made um, a big mark on my life as I got involved into research later. So after the, those trials at the CDC, I came back to Macquarie University to do my master's training in internal medicine. And again, I found that HIV was still a major cause of admission in Lago Hospital where I did my residency and at that time, we know that Mulago Hospital sees over 700,000 patients annually, and 50 to 70% of admissions were HIV related. And at the time, there was no inpatient HIV testing and ART services. So I got my project, I got interested in a project of trying out routine HIV testing in the medical emergency unit and on the wards to see if it was acceptable, because at the time, it was not routine HIV testing. HIV testing was mainly through the voluntary counseling testing sites. So I tried it out, and we found that through these clinical studies at Macquarie, Mulago Hospital, we found that provider-initiated HIV testing was highly acceptable. I also looked at routine TB screening in the TB HIV with 40 TB HIV co-infections in ART treatment programs. So I found that this routine screening for these major diseases was very acceptable and we have since then included them as routine, routine care in our patients. Following that, I joined the Infectious Disease Institute as a research scholar and the, research, the Infectious Disease Institute at Macquarie University is the Regional Center of Excellence in HIV care, research, and training. We offer care to over 20,000 HIV infected adults, and over 7,000 of them are on HIV treatment. Uh, the Institute also supports another 70,000 patients that are not at this site but at different sites in the country. And it was the first one to have a characterized research cohort that started off with 559 patients that were started on treatment and they have been on treatment for over 13 years now. And this has also caused a 
a big platform for us to do to understand better responses to HIV treatment. So during my doctor training, I also found it um, good to go to the lab and be able to do experiments that will answer clinical questions. I got involved in two flow cytometry, molecular studies. Um, so I, I did a number of hands-on bench work to be able to answer some of the questions that we're finding in our patients. So for example, we found that up to 40% of our patients were not responding well to treatment despite having viral suppression. And since then we've done several assays to sort of characterize the problem and we found high levels of inflammation, immune activation, uh, microbial translocation. These are things that our later studies have shown that are affecting patients' response to treatment. So this is just to show that this is what led me to go and do the laboratory work. So I then did my postdoc. I applied for the Glocal postdoc on this program. And this, I executed it through the Gladstone Institute of Vaccination and Immunology at UCSF under the mentorship of Professor Wona Green. And I also got an additional local year to support mentorship activities. So I've also been involved in several mentorship activities to develop other researchers and junior faculty at Macquarie University. I also got a uh, second postdoc with the um, okay, Infection and University Program. This is a Welcome Trust funded program. It also gave me more time to get involved in laboratory work. I worked with the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute at Florida and uh, Rafik Sekali, who is now at Case Western in Reserve University. I also worked with Sarah Roland Jones at the University of Oxford, and this gave me opportunities to get involved in bench work. Um, following that, I got an International Mentored Research Award from CIFA at UCSF um, under Professor Wona Green in collaboration with the Infectious Disease Institute. Um, through this, I also did work on understanding cell death among people living with HIV. And this preceded another grant that I got from the Grand Challenges Canada where I got funding to do a randomized crossover trial to test um, atovastatin as adjunct therapy in air treated patients. And this was mainly to test its effects on immune activation and inflammation among our patients at time to be treatment. So I've had several sub awards from CIFAR at um, at the University of Washington, and these have been mainly looking at HIV prevention in Fisher folk, parental disclosure of HIV status to children with HIV, psychosocial interventions to improve uptake of PMTCT, and all of these have been implemented within their different programs at the Infectious Disease Institute. So maybe just to summarize, I've had an opportunity to take care of HIV patients. I've looked at the clinical presentations, the co-infections, I've worked in the clinical space, and I realized that we need to do laboratory assays, translational work to explain the pathogenesis and try to develop novel interventions on how to handle particularly those patients that remain with persistent inflammation and immune activation despite antiretroviral therapy. So this is um, my team in the clinic. This is myself in the lab doing flow cytometry and other bench work. And this is all to say that together clinical work and laboratory work has helped us to improve the lives of these patients that you see here. This is a team of patients that are living with HIV and are on treatment at the Infectious Disease Institute. Many of them are clinically well and they are able to 
do drama activities and talk about HIV to their community. So just a few challenges about the work. One major challenge, of course, there's not enough time to do everything. There's a lot of thing for work to do, bench work to do, mentoring, and I also am also involved in teaching and team for work. And the ever existing challenge is getting funding for research, given that we have limited local funding for research, so we have to go out and competitively uh, apply for international funding. So this is something that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, so dealing with this, we have been encouraged to do competitive collaborative research with high quality outputs, which have helped us to remain competitive and have some sustainable research groups that can continue to apply for funding. In terms of time, we found that even if there's not enough time for everything, there's need to prioritize. And I found that developing an individual career development plan has helped me to prioritize and do those things that I need to do at each particular phase of my life. Um, there's also a significant challenge of balancing career and family. As a mother of four children, I found that I have to do major adjustments and understand high and low demand seasons for my family and take advantage of these without necessarily stopping my academic work. So my future directions, one is to continue engaging in collaborative research to improve patient care, which is my passion, and I continue to work on that. And then having a multidisciplinary approach to, and to translational science and translational science to improve our patient outcomes. I know that I've been able to work with different people, surgeons, clinicians, and public health specialists on the team to be able to put out comprehensive or multidisciplinary research proposals to keep the work going. And of course, I've also been involved in translation of research to policy, which we need to continue doing, disseminating our work to policymakers and having it getting translated into care, like many of the research findings we have had on cotrimoxazole, autophylaxis, um, translating into basic care package, routine HIV testing, which is now part of the HIV care package in all health units. So we need to continue translating our research into policy. And then, of course, in the, our resource limited settings, we need to continue to support health systems and strengthen them. So all opportunities available to strengthen the health systems would we'll look out for them because we may not be able to improve care without getting into the health care system. And another passion that I continue to do is to mentor. I mentor students, graduate students, doctoral students, and junior faculty to really keep the pipeline of the next generation of researchers, clinicians, research leaders, whom we shall continue to work with to mitigate the challenges, ever-changing challenges in global health. So I wish to acknowledge the teams that I work with at the Infectious Disease Institute, the MOWI team, where I've done my postdoc and group leader awards, um, the IDI as an institute and its leadership and research teams that have supported me. The Department of Medicine, that's where I am best. And of course, my several collaborators at the Gladstone Institute, VGTI, at Makere, MRC, and my mentors at University of Antwerp, all my study participants and all the colleagues that I continue to work with. And 
thank you for coming to attend this session today. So this is the brief account of my career to date, and I'll be happy to receive comments, questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, is everyone there? Oh, it's just, it's just, it's Paul. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakanjako, for such a great presentation. Um, I was just saying, if any of the, if any of the attendees wanted to ask questions through the chat function, you can. And if not, just please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions. Sure. Um, hi, hi again. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, sure. Hi, um, so, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, um, my name is Nerera. I'm from, uh, from Kenya. Mm -hmm. So this is very relevant for us um, in terms of the presentations we've been getting. In, and this is really close to home. And it's fantastic to see all this level of um, achievement and really we're inspired. Um, I think my question is around, what would you attribute, like if you had to pick one thing, what would you attribute as your, the biggest factor in your success uh, as a researcher, a clinician researcher? Thank you for that question. Um, it's a difficult question because I can't pick on one thing that I can attribute to the success, but it's probably a combination of a number of things. And of course, one major thing being the environment, the research environment with mentors and collaborators and yeah, people to work with because we cannot do all this work alone. So I attribute a lot to the environment at Makere and the collaborating institutions, and also to the mentorship that has been provided. Thanks. Hey, this is Phil. What do you um, what do you think are marks of a good collaborator? Because you've collaborated with lots of people over your career so far. What do you think has really stood out as um, yeah, you know, something that really makes for a, a healthy collaboration and a productive um, relationship. So one um, one key thing that I think we have had with many of what I would call good collaborators is having a win-win situation where we find that we sit on the table and look at which things each party would be interested in and how to have a win-win situation in all of these. And of course, mentorship on either side of the collaboration is something that we look at to build sustainability of these collaborations. Um, my, my question, this is Emmanuel from Uganda. My, my question is, what, what would you want um, male clinical researchers to know about their female counterparts that they often get wrong or that they often don't know? Hmm. So, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. So, in the environment we have worked, we find that we have worked both male and female counterparts together. And as I mentioned, we found that the environment is encouraging for both gender without discrimination. Um, yeah, although I think that the female counterparts maybe need to work harder because they have a lot of other, say, family responsibilities in the African setting, especially, where the men may not actually be involved so much in, for example, aspects of childcare and family 
tend to take more time for their female counterparts than their male counterparts. Hi, uh, this is Achana from India. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first regarding uh, we discussed about the collaborators. So can you just give an example of you know how to resolve conflict between collaborators if you had any experience, uh, you had uh, any conflict and how you resolved it? And my Bill, your pardon, uh, please speak louder. I didn't hear okay, the last sorry. part of the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is, uh, how to resolve conflicts between the collaborators? If you had any uh, experience of that, can you please elaborate on that? I beg your pardon again. Experience with what? Maybe I can just jump in. I I think, Archana, and please correct me if I'm wrong, she's just asking if um, how to resolve any conflicts that may arise between oh, okay. the collaborators and yourself. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. So conflict between collaborators, I have found that um, many times conflict has been due to probably a difference of opinion, uh, or assumptions that are made on either side. So I found that in many of them, just communication alone has, the communication has improved this. A lot of transparency, meetings, both virtual and physical meetings. And I would also sum it up that communication and not making assumptions have helped us to solve many of what one may call conflicts that come in just because of difference in opinions, difference in culture, but we found that if the communication channels are open, we are able to handle almost all of these conflicts. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so my, my second question is, um, you mentioned about uh, health systems. Uh, involving like taking the research from uh, the research group of practice. So what do you think are the challenges when we uh, like try to get the health system also involved in the research and to uh, convert them into practice involving the health systems? What are the challenges that you had to face? Okay, so I found that it's very difficult to do research well with uh, a health system that is not functioning. So in many of our clinical studies, when we start them, we find that we have to put in a component of strengthening the healthcare system. For example, we've had studies looking at TB treatment or cryptococcal meningitis treatment. So if we are doing these trials and testing the treatment and then we found that there is no system to monitor these patients. So we cannot only monitor the study patients. We find that we have to expand and monitor all patients that are admitted with that particular illness that we are working on because it would not be ethical just to bring in care and only monitor our patients. So this has, has ended up have, we've, we've had to adjust our studies, maybe have more nurses or have more drugs or more equipment to be able to beef up the system where we're working. Because we cannot only care about our research patients on the same ward where other patients are not being cared for. That's just an example where you find that you cannot have a clinical trial standalone in a system that is not functioning. Thank you, thank you so much. Can I ask another question? Yes, please. Um, off head, what, what would you say are the three simplest interventions with the biggest impact in the 
HIV. Because in the beginning, you talked about sim- simple interventions like um, uh, safe drinking water. I'm just curious, um, what do you think have been the biggest simple interventions in the HIV fight? So, well, I think these, these vary both in the pre-ART and ART era. But I think what cuts across both the PRT and ART era is prevention. Prevention is um, a simple intervention that has helped Uganda as a country a lot, coming in different fashions, starting with the ABC abstinence and behavior change that were very effective in the early days of the HIV epidemic. And since then, all additional preventive strategies have been added to this package, including the pre-exposure prophylaxis that has come on recently. So I think that the big gun for the HIV epidemic is prevention. Thank you. Dr. Nakanjako, I have a question. This is Paul here, but I have a general question more about the funding side of things. Um, in terms of the primary, the funding entities, what do you think are some of the primary funding entities that support global health research outside the US? And then kind of a follow-up to what do you think some are some of the successful ways in which international scientists and non-US scientists can get funding for their research? Okay. So for international uh, scientists, I mean, outside the US, there's uh, a number of training opportunities starting off with the training grants would be a good place to start off with Fogarty, even if it's US based, it has a lot of opportunities for international scientists for training. Uh, so, NIH, per se, and Fogarty have a number of opportunities for training. For example, even CIFA has uh, the mentored, international mentored research program where I was myself able to get an mentored research award. So there are these opportunities that are open for international scientists to apply to. Then from the UK, we have the Wellcome Trust, which also has a number of training opportunities, ranging from career development awards to intermediate, junior, and, and senior fellowships. So we also have the European, the EDCP, which has a number of training fellowships, opportunities for early and mid-career researchers. So I think that there's a fair mix of both US and non-US funding opportunities, uh, especially at a training level, to prepare junior researchers to launch out to the bigger NIH, RO1s, and other bigger funding. Thank you. Well, do we, do we have any other questions for Dr. Nakanjako? If not, Dr. Nakanjako, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, we 
really thank you for being here today. And it was really, really helpful for everyone to listen to you talk today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to participate as a local alumni and now as member of the student committee. Thank you colleagues for tuning in to listen and share your experiences in this talk. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.